Roman? Yeah. Cool. Thanks for having me Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I apologize for the delay. I apologize for the delay. Um, we are we were experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, so maybe we'll wait for another one minute and then um, to see if anyone else is logging in. Okay. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the staff seminar series. Uh, my name is Dr. Simon Chow, and I am today's uh, moderator uh, for, of today's event, uh, Secret Custom Or, the Impact of the Liberation Process on the Identification of Customary International Law. Today, we are very delighted to have Dr. Massimo Lando, um, who will be sharing with us his research. Dr. Lando joined the School of Law as an assistant professor in August 2020. His academic research is in general international law with a special focus on the law of the sea and the settlement of international disputes by judicial processes. Prior to joining the School of Law, he served as an associate legal officer at the International Court of Justice, working in the chambers of Judge Bohat Bandari and Judge at Hawk Charles Brower. He also previously interned at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Dr. Lando completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge, writing a thesis on the establishment of maritime boundaries under international law. He also obtained an LLM from Cambridge, and he is trained in both civil law and common law. Today, we are very fortunate to also have Professor Julian Chase, um, also uh, from City U School of Law, who will be our um, commentator on Dr. Lando's work. Professor Chase is an award-winning scholar and a globally recognized authority on the intersection between international economic law, international dispute resolution, and the transactional law of globalization. His scholarship, which includes a dozen of books and uh, over 60 articles and book chapters, has created an enduring presence in the academic space and has been cited by international courts and tribunals, as well as US, US courts. As a leading scholar in the field of international economic law, Dr. Chase taught in Europe and the Asia Pacific for almost 20 years. And so thank you, uh, Professor Chase, for, for being with us. We are also very pleased today um, to, to be joined by Mr. Charles Mack, uh, visiting researcher at the School of Law Center for Chinese and Comparative Law. He is currently a PhD candidate in international law uh, at the University of Glasgow. So welcome, Charles. Um, today's presentation will last for approximately 35 minutes, uh, followed by comments from Professor Chase, after which uh, the floor will be open to the audience for Q&A. Just a gentle reminder, uh, today's pre presentation will be recorded and the recording may be uh, uploaded to our website or other social media platforms for promotion purposes. And without further ado, um, let's invite Dr. Lando. Thank you very much, Stevenson. And thank you everyone to, for joining the seminar today. And thank you for uh, the comments from uh, Julien Legrand. Um, now, as Stevenson has already given you a bit of a heads up about it, my topic today is about the identification of customer international law by international courts and tribunals. Now, I do realize that I see that some of the, um, of the attendees today may not be uh, describing themselves as uh, public international lawyers, so I will just um, spend a few minutes just giving you a, a quick introduction as to what uh, customer international law is and how it is identified and uh, what the uh, the problems really with the identification of customer international law have been flagged in the literature and how uh, that feeds into the, um, um, the impact that the deliberation processes within international courts and tribunals have on uh, the identification of custom. Now, in general, custom international law can be defined as a source of international law and its classic formulation can be seen in uh, Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, uh, which I will refer from now on as the ICJ. Now, the uh, inter custom international law is an, un an uncodified source of law and it generally is seen as being made up of two different elements. On one hand, we have a state practice, so what states actually do in their relations between each other. And on the other hand, we have what we call opinio juris, which is, uh, could be described as acceptance by states. 
that a particular course of conduct, that a particular behavior is required as a matter of law. Now, in general, the, uh, the cogent approach, the convincing approach to identifying customer international law would be to look into evidence of both of these elements. You look into instances of state practice, instances of opinion juris, and you see on that basis whether there is virtually uniform, uh, uh, extensive and virtually uniform practice and enough opinion juris to arrive at uh, customary uh, international law uh, rules. Now, the problem is that the uh, ideal standard has not always been applied by international courts and tribunals. Now, there's a, since the 1986 judgment in the case between Nicaragua and the United States of America, uh, in which the uh, one of the rules that was in uh, at issue was the principle of non-intervention in domestic affairs of other states, uh, the International Court of Justice in particular has been very much criticized for taking shortcuts to uh, identifying rules of customary international law. So for example, uh, in that case, the problem was that the court had taken uh, virtually uniform opinion juris, but actually made no inquiry into the existence of state practice. And as a result, that, that was seen as taking some sort of shortcut uh, unconvincingly to the identification of custom. And scholars have been writing a lot about the way that the courts and tribunals take these kind of shortcuts. And the interest of scholars have been, has been rekindled recently uh, in, the, uh, in the last 10 years, more or less, uh, a bit less than 10 years. Uh, since the International Law Commission of the United Nations has undertook and in fact finished in 2018 its own study on the identification of customer international law. Now, the uh, International Law Commission came up with a set of draft conclusions that were recommended to the General Assembly uh, in 2018, and uh, these draft conclusions reasserted the two element theory of custom reasserted that the two elements have to be ascertained separately from each other and on the basis of distinct evidence in uh, um, distinct evidence. Now, the problem here is that, um, of course, there has been a complete uh, disregard as to what actually courts do in their day-to-day -day practice when they identify customer international law. In other words, uh, scholars and the International Law Commission have been um, have been positing, have been assuming that international courts and tribunals are, uh, are working as ideal beings that have no internal constraints, when the actual, when the actual um, life of international courts and tribunals is very much shaped by the way, uh, by the internal working methods and internal procedures that, the, the, that these organs use in order to decide cases, in order to write judgments. So um, my, my suggestion to you today, in fact, is, there is, is that these internal working methods have a very strong impact on how international courts and tribunals identify international, customer international law, and specifically also in, uh, on how uh, scholars and states perceive the customary uh, law identification exercise externally when they read the judgments of the court, uh, the judgment of the court. So I will primarily be focusing on International Court of Justice in my uh, remaining remarks, and then I will also um, uh, say a few words about other international courts and tribunals uh, as a, by way of comparison. Um, now, starting with the International Court of Justice, uh, the first thing to, uh, to look into really here is uh, how the uh, deliberation process of the International Court works. Now, despite claims to the contrary by some scholars that are very much uh, acquainted with the, uh, proce the process of deliberation in the court, there isn't actually much engagement with it in the literature, which is why I feel that it is, it is better to, uh, to say a few words about it. Now, it is very composite and very complex, but I will try to boil it down to some uh, to the most important points for the present uh, for the present discussion. Well, once the uh, written proceedings have been done with the filing of the memorials and counter memorials in the international court, the president, the office of the president, will prepare a list of issues, um, which literally is just a list of questions, um, pointing mm -hmm. out all the various points or the various questions that arise for decision in a particular case. Now, um, this is the list of issues that is, uh, this is a list of issues is given out and distributed to all judges before the oral proceedings. And after the oral proceedings are done, judges get together in the, in the deliberation room to decide whether any questions should be amended or anything should be added or taken away from the list of it, this list of issues in the light of what happened in the oral proceedings. Now, after this uh, deliberation uh, concerning the list of issues, judges have two to three weeks in general to come up with a written note, individually uh, come up with a written note, in which they don't do anything else but to write how they would decide a particular case. So each judge basically puts pen to paper and says exactly how they would decide a particular case, taking the list of issues as a blueprint for, uh, for, the, uh, for the decision. 
Now, once the deliberation note is done, this is translated in the other official language of the court, English or French, depending on uh, the case, uh, and is also distributed to all the other judges that after two weeks, having the benefit of having read the uh, their colleagues' views, they get together once again in the, in the deliberation room in order to uh, Re repeat really their views. They don't do anything anything more but repeat what they already wrote in the deliberation note. But the thing is, some judges sometimes change their mind upon reading the notes of their own colleagues, or maybe they don't have uh, their views entirely formed on certain subjects. And that's one of those situations in which they can actually make their views known. Now, at the end of this session of deliberation, though, a very important and crucial step happens, which is the election of a drafting committee. So two of the judges that uh, are in the majority uh, in, in, in within the court that the president has identified during this meeting um, will be elected by their peers to form a drafting committee and the drafting committee uh, is the uh, organ that actually writes the judgment. Uh, the, the drafting committee is usually chaired by the president if the president is in the majority uh, and if not it will be the vice president and then go in order of seniority uh, down from that. Now, once the uh, drafting committee has written the first draft of the judgment, there will be a round of written uh, amendments if the other judges can, uh, can propose. Once that is done, the, a new draft will be, will be released and there will be a reading, uh, what we call the first reading of the draft judgment. Now, in the first reading, you have to imagine these judges sitting around a round table and uh, the, uh, there will be screens at the back of the room and on the screens, the text of the judgment and judges will go uh, through the judgment paragraph by paragraph, making uh, comments, making amendments and so on. Now, the more wide ranging amendments will not be made in their meeting. They will be left for the drafting committee to deal with later on, but the change of a word or uh, minor changes will be done there and then instead. So after this first reading, the drafting committee makes further amendments to the draft judgment. There is a second reading and at the end of the second reading, a vote and the adoption of the judgment. So that is the end of the deliberation process at the International Court. Now, um, the question is, what, what are the consequences of this deliberation process in the way that the International Court um, draft, drafts its judgment? And what are the implications for custom identification exercises? Well, I would like to point out three main consequences and see what implications they have for the identification of customer international law. Now, the first one is a certain tendency by the ICJ uh, to, uh, towards minimalistic reasoning. Now, the fact of having a very collegial um, deliberation process basically means the court always strives to uh, find a text which is as agreeable to as many judges as possible, so as not to have very thin majorities within, uh, within the court. Um, now, this basically uh, means that the, um, the reasoning itself might be past the bone uh, to a certain extent. And this sometimes is also clear in the way that the court identifies custom. Uh, an example that I can give you is from a case from back in 2002 between Belgium and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the so-called arrest warrant case, in which the court had to identify whether the um, there was a, whether there was a customary rule that was giving immunity from civil and criminal jurisdiction of other states to high-ranking state officials, such as uh, heads of state, heads of government, and foreign ministers. And the court really uh, decided that particular point in one very short sentence, simply stating that according to it, uh, because uh, of state sovereignty, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, it had to deduce from state sovereignty that there was a customary rule of international law um, that would prevent uh, these high-ranking state officials from being under the jurisdiction of uh, the courts of other states. Now, the reality is that when one looks at the deliberation process that I have just um, um, tried to explain to you, uh, there are various points at which uh, the, the court could, um, in a way, avoid actually falling into minimalistic reasoning. Now, the list of issues of the president, for example, will sometimes uh, say very clearly, uh, put out very clearly a question concerning whether there is state practice or opinion juris in relation to the existence of a particular rule of international law. Now, when judges write their individual note, their Article 5 deliberation note, uh, they will, uh, some of them will be looking into uh, instances of state practice and opinion juris. They will be trying to, um, to induce customer international law instead of simply asserting what customer international law is. Um, so the, the approaches, however, they may vary a lot depending on um, 
one of those variables that we scholars cannot probably do much about, which is the professional and personal background of the judges prior to coming on the international bench. Now, if you think about, for example, the difference between uh, the, the way the civil law judges and common law judges write judgments, that's already one very, uh, one very big uh, distinction between, between these two legal traditions. The civil law judges tend to uh, be uh, much terse, uh, much terser, sorry, in the um, in their, judge, in their judgments, they tend to state what the legal principle is and apply it to the facts. Whereas on the other hand, common law judges are not far into this idea of very long discursive judgments that really engage with the arguments of the parties. So think about a House of Lords judgment or a US Supreme Court judgment by comparison, if you have ever read any of them to a French court of cassation judgment or an Italian one, uh, it's, it's very much, there's, there's a big difference there uh, to be made. And of course, these approaches are also very relevant when uh, the uh, judges are uh, to put pen to paper and write the judgment. So um, depending on which legal tradition the judges and the drafting committee come from, you might have one ten tendency towards more or less minimalistic reasoning in the, um, in the, in the judgment itself. And we all know that once the words are on the page, it may be difficult to change them or difficult to add to them. Uh, once they're on the page, they're on the page and that's it. So I suppose that the point I want to make is that whenever all the scholars and states uh, outside the court see simply an assertion of what the court has been uh, identifying as custom, it doesn't mean the court actually hasn't done some sort of an inductive exercise behind the scenes. Uh, it is. The only problem is that we, we are not privy to that exercise because of the confidentiality of the uh, deliberation process. Um, I would like to pass to my second consequence uh, on, of the deliberation process of the ICJ. And this is something that more than uh, um, looking at the micro level of how the um, judgment is written, it has something to do with the macro level. So the way that the judgment is actually structured in the very first place. And this is, idea, this is the idea that the uh, court adapts the way that it writes judgments depending on the subject matter of a particular, of a particular, um, of a particular case. Now, the reality is that um, the expectation, well, the expectation would be that if a particular case, for example, turns on the existence or non-existence of a rule of custom, the court would be more or less um, well, it would be probably more actually, um, how do you say, uh, cogent and, and persuasive in uh, identifying this rule of custom. And as a result, they would try to do that by way of an inductive exercise rather than simply asserting what custom international law is. And instead, in the other on the other hand, if a case doesn't turn on custom, then you don't need to do as much induction. You can simply say what international law is. But the reality is that if one looks at the jurisprudence, the court does uh, a bit of everything, really. In cases that turn on customer international law existence, they sometimes induce custom, sometimes they don't. So, for example, in the case between Germany and Italy about the jurisdictional immunity of the state back in 2012, the court went uh, through a very detailed analysis of state practice and opinion juris evidence in order to decide whether there was a customer international law exception to the immunity of states before the courts of other states. But in a more recent case, there was the um, advisory opinion on the, uh, on the administration of the Chagos Archipelago by the United Kingdom that turned on the existence of a right to self-determination in 1965 to 68. The court was much, uh, was much terser in the reasoning. The court didn't actually look into instances of state practice and limited itself only to noting that there were a number of General Assembly resolutions that had been passed at the time of at the relevant time uh, on the basis of which the court simply deduced that there was some sort of rule of custom international law that had to do with self-determination and therefore decided the case on that basis. Now the court does things inconsistently basically and that's that's no surprise really but one question that arises really is whether the degree to which the party's arguments might actually influence the court to taking one course over another um, and the reality there is that again uh, there isn't really one uh, size fits all uh, answer to this but it seems like the party's arguments do to an extent play a role in how the court shapes its reasoning in relation to these cases turning on customer international law now if you take the nicaragua and united states case in 1986 for for example, in that case, the United States did not appear in court and Nicaragua did not actually put before the court any evidence of state practice or opinion juris. And the court, in fact, didn't do much of an inductive exercise at all. But then if you look at the Germany-Italy case that I just uh, told you about, then in that case, states, the, both parties, Germany and Italy, they put before the court a lot of evidence of customer of custom international law existence. 
Um, and the court even went beyond what the parties have, parties have done. The court actually went out and sought for itself the, uh, whether there were other instances of state practice and opinion euros. But I suppose that at the end of the day, it's, it's a bit difficult to say exactly what kind of approach will, the court will take, what macro approach the court will take based on the subject matter of the case and the uh, and the party's arguments, um, which is not, I suppose, very good news for states that are about to approach litigation in the international court, uh, which turns on the existence of, of custom. Now, the third consequence that I would like to talk to you about is the tendency of the court to resort to what some other scholars have called argumentative shortcuts. This would be certain ways of framing the court's findings that are supposed to avoid um, um, making certain issues within the case become sticking points in the deliberations. So in order to um, to find as much as, as broad an agreement as possible. Uh, this might be, for example, reliance on uh, the court's own previous decisions, what we might call precedent, even though there isn't binding precedent in international law, or reliance on studies of the International Law Commission, or sometimes even simply satisfying itself that parties agree that a particular rule is customary in status. Now, uh, there is a general view among scholars that argumentative shortcuts are bad, they're not good judicial reasoning. Uh, but I suppose that the sc if sc scholars stop at saying that they are bad, they don't actually capture the nuance of what the court is trying to do with these argumentative shortcuts and why the court actually deploys these techniques. Well, the why I suppose is quite clear. They're trying to breach as broad an agreement as possible. But the question arises as to whether any of these shortcuts are actually sound ways of identifying customer international law or not. And I suppose that, again, a one-size-fits-all answer is difficult to, to reach, but I can just go through a couple of these shortcuts and show that some of them might and some of them might not be as sound uh, a way of identifying custom as one might think. So uh, taking, for example, the studies of the International Law Commission. Now, the International Law Commission is known for codifying international law, but also progressively developing international law sometimes, which means that the International Law Commission in its studies sometimes is very clear as to what, the, what it is doing is taking um, and writing down on paper a rule which is already part of custom, and sometimes instead saying that there is a rule which is uh, uh, part of customary international law, but not quite yet. The rule is still developing and we will need a bit more state practice, a bit more opinion juris in order for the rule to become finally part of customary international law. So depending on what the court is actually, the SEJ is relying on, whether they're relying on a progressive development exercise or a codification exercise, then the, um, the reliance on, on the ILC for as an argumentative shortcut might be more or less warranted, more or less justified. Um, the other, uh, the second uh, shortcut would be the reliance on the court's own previous decisions, what we call internal precedent. And again, I suppose that the, the um, what de determines whether that is a good shortcut or not is whether the decision on which the court relies as the, uh, or as the original precedent, let's say, is uh, a decision in which the court induced the existence of a customer rule of international law, or rather deduced or deduced it or asserted it. I suppose that if, the, uh, if it is one or the other, it might be more or less cogent a, uh, a way of deploying the court's reasoning rather than uh, doing the whole um, customary law in an identification exercise from the very, uh, from the very beginning. Uh, the one, though, um, shortcut which can be problematic in the majority of, of cases is simply relying on the fact that the parties agree that a particular rule is customary in status. Now, uh, there's one scholar, a German scholar, that has uh, suggested that whenever the court relies on the parties' agreement, the court is actually sacrificing the generality of its uh, reasoning and confining it to the case between those two parties. Now, that might be true in, in, in terms of strict legal, legal principle because the decision of, a, of, of, a, of the court is only binding between the parties to the particular case. But the reality is that the court is considered by the wider international law community to state what international law is. So if the court takes the parties' agreement only on that basis, decides that a certain rule is custom, what it is doing is basically generalizing the agreement of those parties and applying it to everyone else uh, in the world that uh, later on might rely on that uh, decision in order to state uh, that a particular rule is customary or not. So this is so much I want, this, as much as I want to say in relation to the international court. I would like to pass on now to, uh, to look at other international courts and tribunals as comparators. 
Now, there are, I divide them, I would like to divide them in two different kinds of international courts and tribunals, depending on the kind of um, deliberation process they use. On one hand, we have those um, ICJ-like collegial deliberation processes, and those are used by the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or ITLOS, and the appellate body of the World Trade Organization. And on the other hand, we have the um, uh, non-collegial and uh, deliberation processes that do rely on the existence of a judge rapporteur that writes the decision in the first instance. And this would be something that the European Court of Human Rights does, for example, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and also the Court of Justice of the European uh, Union. Now, the expectation would be that ICJ-like processes will yield ICJ-like results and a judge rapporteur system might actually yield different results. Uh, for example, there might be more induction in the judge rapporteur system because the judgment is actually written by one person with one mind and there is limited um, interaction in terms of um, uh, other judges chipping in to, to change the judgment. In reality, things are not as they actually seem and uh, the expectation might be uh, a bit disappointed. Now, looking at ITLOS and the appellate body, the WTO, they, they uh, hardly ever induce the existence of any uh, rule of custom international law. What they do actually mostly is simply assert what international law is, or they rely on precedents by the International Court of Justice. That's really what they do. In terms of the other courts and tribunals that rely on a judge rapporteur system instead, now the European Court of Human Rights and Inter-American Court of Human Rights rely a lot on the previous decisions of the International Court of Justice. Um, but it's interesting that they do so when they are to identify a particular customary rule for the first time. When they have done it already, uh, the second time and third time onwards, what they do is they refer to their own jurisprudence, basically. So um, uh, it's a, it's a two-tiered uh, system, I suppose, of, uh, of uh, relying on precedent. First, they rely on external precedent, then they rely on internal precedent. Uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union is an interesting example because besides having judge rapporteurs, they also benefit from having advocates general. Uh, so each judge, sorry, each, each case has one advocate general which is assigned to it, and the advocate general prepares a recommendation, an opinion, which is given to all the judges of the chamber tasked with deciding the particular uh, case. Um, and the opinion will be on how the Advocate General thinks the case should be decided. Inter uh, probably not surprisingly, the Advocates General are the ones that are responsible for mo most custom identification exercises at the Court of Justice of the European Union. But they also don't really, don't really induce custom. What they do is that they uh, mainly assert what custom international law is. They rely on external uh, precedent, especially the International Court of Justice. Um, sometimes they do try to do some sort of induction, but they don't really succeed very well because either they limit themselves to uh, not exploring a lot of, or enough really, uh, evidence of state practice and opinion juris, or they look at only one of the two elements where what they should do is to look at both. So um, the question now becomes to me anyway, uh, what are the reasons for this particular trend in these international courts and tribunals? Even though we might expect something different, why do they do things in the, in the same way? Why do they do what they do? Well, um, to me, there are some, some reasons relating to the deliberation process. There's some other ones that are uh, all the same, part, um, not directly relating to the deliberation process itself. So um, starting with the ones, the, with the reasons that are relating to the deliberation process, um, one thing that I think is important to remember is that these international courts and tribunals that are um, not the ICJ, not its laws, and not the appellate body, the WTO, they have much heavier dockets than uh, any of the other ones. And by much heavier dockets, I mean they have hundreds to thousands of cases, whereas the International Court of Justice had, uh, I believe, 195 cases since 1945. Um, in its laws, in um, slightly more than 25 years, they had uh, only 29 cases. Now, that means that judges should have a bit more time to dedicate to uh, find instances of uh, opinion juries and state practice, whereas in these other international courts and tribunals, they, there's, there's not enough time to dedicate to each and every one of these cases. They might have customary law points that uh, arise for decision. But the reality is that despite there being a heavier docket, there, is also a, uh, there are also greater research capabilities in the sense that the legal departments of the uh, European and Inter-American Court and the uh, um, European Union Court of Justice, they are much bigger. They can, so judges can um, rely on the research assistant, uh, research assistants of many more lawyers. And there is no reason really why some of them uh, could not be tasked with uh, identifying 
uh, evidence of, of state practice and opinion euros. Even more so when it happens in the European Court of Human Rights in particular, the some of judges in their individual opinions appended to the judgments, uh, they actually do induce customer international law. So the, the, the question is, why do they do, the, do, do they do this induction exercise in their individual opinions, but not in the judgment itself? And I suppose that thinking a bit about it, the reason that I, I, I would, able, would be able to identify for this is that, again, it get, really depends on uh, the background of the judge that puts pen to paper and writes the judgment itself, so the judge rapporteur, basically. Now, we can stay here and debate a lot about the qualifications for becoming a judge on the international bench, but the, um, the, what happens in practice is that judges that sit on the European Court, Inter-American Court, and Court of Justice of the European Union uh, come from a variety of backgrounds, but a lot, a lot of them come from the higher judiciary in their uh, countries of origin. Now, um, I, I don't mean any harm to the, uh, to the judges of the, uh, of, 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 in domestic law courts, uh, but I suppose that there is a general perception that judges in domestic, in domestic courts, they do, they're not as acquainted with international law, and let alone the intricacies, the methodological intricacies of custom identification, as, for example, someone that studies international law at a scholarly level might be, or someone, for example, that has been a professor in international law, and then after that, becomes a member of an international court or tribunal. So I suppose that a lot really of what goes on in these international courts and tribunals that do not apply uh, ICJ style deliberation processes is actually due to the to the professional background, to the preparation of these judges that sometimes quite frankly don't really know enough about what they are uh, called upon to doing. Uh, and the reason for that uh, being also that the uh, logic of political negotiation and political bargaining is not entirely foreign to the election of international judges. So, of course, that might translate itself into the um, a point, well, into the election of judges that maybe uh, might not as might not be as acquainted with the subject matter of uh, the uh, of what they're going to judge. So hopefully during their tenure as judges, they might improve a little bit at a time, but that of course does reflect itself in the way that they discharge the judicial business. There are also some, some factors that I believe are, are not entirely related to the deliberation process. They're probably entirely unrelated to it. Um, I suppose that um, one suggestion that has been done, made by one of the European Court of Human Rights judges is that the ECHR does not have the jurisdiction to uh, decide whether a particular rule is part of customer international law or not, because what the court, European Court of Human Rights is called upon to do is apply the Convention of Human Rights. They're not called upon to apply customer international law. Now, this may seem attractive as an argument, but I think it's a, it's a bit fallacious on, on two grounds. The first one is that it is well contradicted by the, by the European Court's own jurisprudence, because the European Court of Human Rights has stated, for example, the rules of international law concerning the law of the sea are uh, part of customer international law, and that has nothing to do with the Euro European Convention of Human Rights. And on the other hand, uh, there's also something to say about the fact that the European Court of Human Rights should not conceive of itself only as applying the convention. I don't think anyone in their, um, in their right mind, if I may say so actually, would think that the European Court should be applying the European Convention in complete isolation from other rules of international law. The perception among scholars and the, the conviction among scholars and, and practitioners is that international law is a system of rules that interact with each other. They're not uh, water, there are not watertight distinctions between different fields of international law. It, it should be a harmonious whole um, that interacts with each other in, in a way that makes sense. And uh, that, of course, would be problematic if one were to take up what the uh, this, um, European Court of Human Rights judge has been suggesting. I suppose, however, that belonging to a particular treaty regime, uh, belonging to a court or tribunal that operates within a particular treaty regime might actually affect to some extent the mindset of some of the judges that might actually feel that they're not really called upon to say much about custom because that's not really what they have been elected to do. And they'd rather actually leave that to a court of general jurisdiction, such as International Court of Justice, which instead is the one that should be inducing rules of custom international law. We're not here to induce, we're simply here to apply the European Convention. The maximum that we can do is simply say whether we think that something is part of custom or not without having to do too much of an inductive process. Uh, the problem there is that what happen, uh, that is that by applying this mindset, you're potentially outsourcing part of your judicial function to an external court. Because if you have to apply, for example, rules of state responsibility that are very much relevant to human rights claims in the European Court of Human Rights, 
um, and you want to know whether a particular rule of state responsibility is part of customer international law, you will look at international court of justice's decisions and you will be in a way outsourcing the decision as to whether a rule is customary to what the international court of justice is saying. Um, Sometimes the last thing I want to say is that sometimes um, within these specific treaty regimes, uh, international courts and tribunals, they actually uh, develop their own particular notions, their own particular um, um, legal, uh, legal concepts that might come into play when uh, either identifying customer international law. And again, I want to make an example from the European Court of Human Rights. This is the example of uh, the notion of European consensus. So the idea that there is a particular position which is shared amongst states of the uh, parties to the European Convention of Human Rights, and these states, uh, they have a common position on how to interpret or apply the convention in a particular way. Now, the court in a case uh, concerning Ireland, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, in a case concerning Ireland, they uh, have applied this notion of European consensus to find whether there was a customary, um, customary rule um, limitation to the right uh, on the right of abortion, as Ireland was uh, arguing in that particular case. Um, the problem with using the notion of European consensus and we're using notions that are peculiar to specific treaty systems is that um, you are not looking into both the elements of custom international law. You're only looking into one of them. And in particular, in this case will be the, in, in relation to European consensus, it will be the element of opinion euros. Um, and also the problem is that you are basically generalizing the uh, conclusion that you make on the basis of the um, of a notion peculiar to one treaty regime in a way not too dissimilar to generalizing what the parties agree customer international law is at the International Court of Justice. So by way of conclusion, I would like to uh, point out two um, wider implications of, of uh, the, the uh, argument of view I've been, I've been trying to um, to explain and to, and to make today. One for the International Law Commission's uh, draft conclusions on international, custom international law, and the other one for the scholarly debate on international, uh, on custom international law. Now, in relation to the International Law Commission, there is something to say about the fact that the um, ILC, by reasserting that custom international law has to be um, found on the basis of the two element theory, um, has basically acted uh, on, the, on the abstract level. They, they, have, they have basically, um, set out some aspirational guidelines that international courts and tribunals should be abiding by, but without really engaging with what international courts and tribunals do on the ground. As a result, I suppose that the uh, conclusions that were recommended to the General Assembly in 2018 seem to be mainly aspirational in character because what really would be necessary in order to ensure that international courts and tribunals induce rules of customer international law instead of simply asserting or deducing them would be some, 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 somewhat of a reform, really, into the internal working mechanisms and methods of international courts and tribunals. Now, the reality is that international courts and tribunals have been inducing custom even within the framework of the current internal working methods. The problem is that the track record of doing so is not very good, and we cannot really just rely on what has been done before in order to, uh, to say that things are going to get better, basically, for uh, custom identification. In relation to the scholarly debate, um, I suppose that uh, the wider implication there is the um, it, it's more it's more an encouragement, I suppose, and more a hope I have uh, as as a scholar of international law uh, that other scholars that are interested in the um, in the identification of customer international law might actually start looking at this particular topic with a bit more nuance and not criticize international courts and tribunals for the sake of criticizing them. Now we all know the scholars that simply agree with what international courts and tribunals do are not doing necessarily very good scholarship because uh, criticism is the, is the lifeblood of the, of, of, uh, the lifeline of, of, uh, of a scholarly endeavor really. Um, but I suppose there's some nuance as to uh, what the international courts and tribunals do would be probably very much welcome in this particular, in this particular um, field of custom identification. What international courts, international law scholars can do though, is um, do uh, a bit of an evaluative assessment of what the international courts and tribunals do when they uh, identify customer international law by assertion or by deduction. And this is because the evidence of state practice and opinion viewers is public. It has to be public in order for uh, international, um, inter custom international law to be identified. So, um, I suppose that I would like to end here with a, on a note of encouragement to other scholars, uh, uh, so, some of which I hope we'll see, we'll see the uh, seminar maybe on the YouTube channel of the, of the, uh, of the law school.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Massimo. Uh, may we now invite uh, Professor Chase um, to say a few words, to, to give some comments on the presentation, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Stevenson. Uh, can I just ask you how long uh, you can give me for my, my very modest comments? Um, around 10 minutes. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you because I'm I'm really glad to be uh, to be discussing today. As I as I truly enjoyed the presentation, uh, I believe that the research is important for many reasons. So, for the discussion, let me uh, let me break out um, my discussion in two main parts. I'd like to start with some very uh, general comments and then move on into a second part dealing with specific questions and again specific comments. So. Um, let me start with um, the few general points. So Massimo's work um, is about the ICG's collegial deliberation process uh, on its choice of custom identification methodology. Uh, the question of the deliberation process is important because it may explain uh, in parts or in all the methodology. And the methodology impacts a range of normative questions among the most important for the international legal order. Uh, for instance, the, the answers or, or some answers given by, um, by Massimo can help in defining the law within the ICJ's jurisdiction, how the line is drawn between lex lata and delegate veranda. In other words, what's the, the con contemporary international law and where does the progressive development of the law commence? So uh, that's very important for these reasons. Also, the topic of custom identification methodology is, is important because the existence of a norm of customary international law in line with um, the, the mainstream understanding of custom as a source of international law is only acknowledge when sufficient evidence of state practice and opinion juris is, is adduced. Uh, there is no agreement, however, on the precise method to be used to determine specific norms of custom or on how to make sense of disparate evidences or evidentiary materials. Uh, I also note that there is a wealth of scholarship on customary international law. However, most of these works have in common that they try to offer um, new theories or methods for ascertainment of customary rules in various fields, whether the law of the sea, trade law, criminal law, and so on. So I enjoyed very much um, Massimo's presentation for, for two reasons in general. First, he takes um, a radically different perspective, which is rooted in the ACJ's deliberation process. Or I could say, in plain, uh, using plain words, it looks at the practice of the courts or the courts in the internal making of the decisions, and that's very new. That's very interesting. Uh, secondly, what I also find very interesting is that he offers a kind of insiders analysis, and he also tries to compare that to a number of other tribunals. So it's not just the ACJ; it's many others. Okay, so that's. Uh, another, another very important point. Now, coming to my to my specific questions and comments, uh, I must tell you I, I've got many. I'll try to be reasonable and and say I'll I'll try to identify six or so topics, themes with with comments and and questions. And I was thinking about how to organize them. I think I will organize that in three three sections basically. I have a first set of comments questions dealing with. Uh, what I would call the, the 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 behavioral aspects of the law, basically here, how the courts and tribunals behave during the uh, deliberative process. Uh, in the second section, I will I will touch upon some uh, or a couple of normative questions, and in the third section, I like to discuss a bit more the the interaction between the ICJ and some of the other courts. Uh, and the comparisons offered by by Massimo in his presentation. So I start with with um, 
Uh, the first point is the the idea to look at how the deliber deliberative process is taking place. Um, here I find that Massimo did a great job explaining the, the ACJ deliberative process. I understand that you, you deal with very scant information and relatively understudied issue. I wonder whether you don't tend to focus a bit too much though on the deliberative process as a framework for dealing with methodological questions. Um, it's not because that there is one procedure, I would say, that there'll be one single approach or methodology that the court will, will use. I would, in fact, rather assume that individual judges of the court, including, um, for that purpose, ad hoc uh, judges, have many opportunities to influence the interpretation of a customary norm uh, during the various stages of the, the process. And in this respect, what I wanted to ask you is whether it would make sense to explore whether individual judges have used or exerted their influence on the different custom identif identification methodologies. Or let me put it differently. Um, can you exclude that in a given case, a judge has influence on the custom identification methodology? which could explain why there are different custom identification methodologies uh, that we can observe in, in various ICJ's decision. Um, still on the same theme, I have a, a second question in the form of a clarification request. So you focus on, on the so-called deliberation process. And again, it's, it's fantastic the work you, you've done that. Is that equivalent to studying collegiality? Um, in fact, scholars, whatever the field, do not have access to collegial interactions among judges on the court or tribunal, because most uh, decisions or, or, or deliberations are confidential. So it's understandable that scholars have not um, given collegiality the attention it deserves. But there is some very interesting work on that, for instance, by an American scholar, an American judge called uh, Harry Edwards, and so my question is, um, are the concepts of collegiality and deliberation process equivalent in your mind? And if not, uh, what differences does it make for you to focus on deliberation process as opposed to collegiality? Um, you explain very well also how the, the deliberative process um, following the more formal party-driven return and role phases, give opportunities to judges to influence the decision and methodology. And, and, and your comments on the successive steps are really great. Now, my question is whether some of these steps are not potentially more important than others, always in order to influence the choice of the methodology and so on, right? So for instance, what, what looks like the you step number two, uh, you know, when the judges have several weeks to prepare their, their written notes, in which they offer, as you explained, their, their tentative views regarding the issues. To me, it seems that this stage of the deliberations is very conducive to influence on the methodology, perhaps even more than, than the other. So I'd like to have your views on, on that, whether there is uh, one or more steps more important. That was for uh, the deliberation process. And I have a second group of questions that I would say are more normative questions. Um, because I think that your presentation really raises um, a number of important normative questions, which I have noted here. I will just mention two, all right? Uh, the first one is uh, very simply, what importance should be given to the opinions of individual judges appended to an ICJ ruling um, determining a custom, and especially in cases decided by the casting votes of the ICJ president. Um, another question I, I just noted is, um, so according to the paragraph 28, uh, article 28, paragraph 1D of the ICJ statutes. Uh, 
Um, it says that judicial decisions and the literature are only subsidiary means for establishing international law. So if I understand correctly, that means that judicial decisions and scholarly writings cannot be relied upon as primary sources in defining the customary law. Now, how do you deal with, with this limitation constituted by, by this Article 28, Paragraph 1D? Could, could you clarify whether um, could you clarify whether and to what extent this provision may impact the deliberations of the judges? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Julien. That was uh, that was exhaustive. <laughs> thank you very much, also for the uh, for the comments that you made. Uh, very encouraging, and I appreciate that. So um, I will go straight into the questions that you that you asked. So in relation to the. Um, the individual judges and the way that they might approach methodologies in a different way. I mean, there's definitely a, there's definitely a difference there to be made, and I suppose the different judges do. Okay, well, let me, let me put it this way. Um, I am coming to write this piece, and I wouldn't have written it if I hadn't worked in international court before. I don't think I, I would have even thought of the deliberation process as being something that impacts the way the customer international law is identified. And in my three and a half years there, I have seen judges doing custom identification in different ways. And that comes through, especially in one of the stages that you were focusing on, which is the uh, the written note, the individual note the judges write and then distribute it before the election of the drafting committee. Now, the reality is that judges do a variety of things. Some of them simply assert custom, some of, some of them do a very inductive exercise all the time and so on. It's a bit difficult exactly to know which one is going to end up in the judgment. But the thing is, if a judge is elected to a drafting committee that has already induced custom in their written note, then chances are that the, that the draft that this judge will write will also have an inductive element for the identification of customer international law. So it's a bit different, it's a bit difficult to say that really. And, and a lot actually depends on the style of certain judges. So for example, um, I don't wanna name names, but uh, there are judges, for example, that um, will write a note, uh, which is 10 pages long for a complex case. And judges that for the same case will, lie, will write a 55 page note. So of course the judge with a 10 page note probably is not going to do much of an inductive exercise in relation to custom identification. And maybe instead the one that uh, comes up with the 55 page note might be more likely to do so. So it's, it's a bit difficult to say exactly which one is going to prevail. Uh, but I do feel that, yeah, it, it definitely individual judges do things in a different way. That's, that's for sure. And I think there's a very interesting sociological in a way, um, a research, a piece of research to be done there. You know, how do judges actually do it? The problem is that if you go and interview these judges, they will not want to say who they are. They will not want to say too much. So it's always problematic to do that kind of research, I suppose, in relation to the International Court of Justice. Um, collegiality and deliberation. So your second question. I suppose that to my mind, um, I haven't actually, I, I have to be honest, I haven't actually thought of collegiality and deliberation processes as being two different things. I've, all, I've only focused on the, on the deliberation process and I've always thought to my mind that some deliberation processes are collegial and some others are not collegial. In a sense, they, they emphasize this element of we do something together instead of an element of we delegate this work to someone else, basically, the way that, for example, the uh, European Court of Human Rights might do. I suppose that they're all collegial to some degree, but there are some that are more collegial than others, in the sense that the, in the ICJ, for example, even the writing of the judgment is done by a, by a three-judge committee. So, um, you know, this collegiality to an extent, even within the, uh, the, um, the, the drafting committee setting. And I suppose this also probably is something that could be explored from the point of view of, of the social sciences that are not law. You know, what is, what is exactly, what does it mean collegiality in a, in a, um, in a uh, organ like the International Court of Justice, for example, and uh, how, what are the, the characteristics, I suppose, of, of a collegial deliberation process over non-collegial deliberation process. Um, it's something that I haven't actually given much thought to, and you are the first one that kind of points me towards this direction. So I don't wanna, I want to say much more about it because otherwise I would just be blabbering. Um, on your third question about the, where, whether there are certain st stages in the deliberation process that are more important than others for custom identification, I would say definitely, there are definitely some stages more important than others. Now you identified one of them, which is the, uh, the individual written note. And I think, as I said before, that's really important because it sets out how judges would decide the case. And um, if a judge induces custom there, probably they will do so also if they're elected in a on a drafting committee. 
I suppose that the crucial step, though, at least to my mind, is really the writing of the judgment by the judge on the drafting committee. Um, I suppose that even if a judge has induced custom in the written note, they might actually hold back when they're writing up the judgment for the simple reason that they might feel already that the whole inductive exercise might be too much for the court to bear, might be too much for the colleagues to, to, to agree with, so they will do something else instead. I mean, the, the reality of things, and um, <laughs> I don't want to seem too critical here, but um, some judges are more careful than others when they do, when, when they draft or when they write. Um, and that's just, I suppose, part of being human. You know, some, some of us are more careful about certain things than others. And that goes also for judges, unfortunately. So you might have some judges that are more uh, sensitive towards writing about certain topics than others. And that reflects itself, of course, in the way that a judgment is being written. So to me, really, the crucial part is the, um, the election of the drafting committee and the writing of the judgment by the drafting committee. Your fourth question is the importance of uh, opinions, of individual opinions on uh, the um, on custom identification. I mean, I suppose that I have a bit of a blasé attitude towards uh, individual opinions. I, I don't think much of them. <laughs> I know that a lot of the times, whenever whenever I, I write to uh, I write uh, something and I send it to a in review uh, to a journal, uh, the, the the reviewers come back to me and say, "Oh, but you haven't considered the individual opinion of judge such and such in this in this case." You know, my usually my usual thought is yes, I know I haven't considered, but it's an individual opinion, and it has nothing to say to, to say about what I am saying. So why should I just be t telling you about the individual opinion? I suppose that individual opinions become only important, and that also applies to uh, customer identification, if the if the argument in, in the individual opinion is later on taken up by the court itself, and it happened in the past in relation to some concepts that now are entrenched in the procedure of the international court. But to my knowledge, it hasn't actually happened in relation to customer international law. So um, I, I wouldn't probably think too much of individual opinions. They're, they're important, they're nice to read, and they're good way, you know, they're good way to see how much the court is actually doing the work it's supposed to do. Um, but probably I, would, I wouldn't over rely on them. That's what I'm, that's what, that's what I'm saying. And as to your last point, uh, Article 38.1D of the Anti-J Statute, uh, judicial decisions as subsidiary means. Um, this can open a very big can of worms, and I suppose that uh, you know we, we, we many scholars have different ideas about how uh, judicial decisions interact and as a source of international law. Um, my own idea is that we don't give enough kudos to uh, judicial decisions. We don't actually um, we don't we don't actually give them the right the right the place that they rightfully deserve, in the sense that international law. Being a um, a system where there is a decentralized lawmaking uh, lawmaking mechanism, there isn't parliament, there isn't any congress that tells us what the law is. Um, judicial decisions become extremely important to to identify what the law is or might be or may be in uncodified areas of the law, very much like a common law system. It's, 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 nearly, it's nearly like the development of the common, the common law in the, uh, in the first few centuries of, of the law in, in England. You know, you, there are certain cases in which the courts just don't have the instruments to tell us what the law is. So they just make something up. Um, and that, for example, has actually happened, uh, at least to, to, to my, uh, in my view, it happened in relation to uh, the uh, establishment of maritime boundaries that was the topic of my PhD. And in fact, one of the claims I make on my, in my book on, on maritime delimitation is that it is necessary for, um, for scholars and practitioners and the courts to, deter, to um, accept that at least in the, in the context of maritime boundary delimitation, the decisions of international courts and tribunals should be um, seen as a formal source of international law, a directly applicable source of international law in the way that um, it has uh, not been seen by orthodox um, scholars so far, um, so to speak. In relation to customer international law, I don't think that that changes much. You know, if a court states what international law is and it's a, there's a judicial decision that says that that's into customer international law, I would probably treat it in the very same way. The, the court is simply stating something in a, in some, they're making a judicial, authoritative judicial pronouncement in, a, in an area which is uncodified, in which we simply don't know yet exactly what the law is. Let's just take it as the answer as to what the law is. I would just be very pragmatic about it.
Right, thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Um, is there any very quick feedback from uh, Professor Chase before we open the floor for questions? Yes, I very much appreciate the answers given by Massimo. I think it's a very good discussion. I would have many other, many other questions to, to ask in relation to WTO and some other aspects, but I see that colleagues are already waiting to ask their own questions, so I suggest that, that we move on and give them a chance to, to ask their questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Fozia, um, I know you have a question. Fozia, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moore. It was a very good uh, presentation. Thank you, Professor Shees, for your comments. Um, I have a very quick question, something that we already probably um, have covered, but just want to sort of emphasize it a little bit. I just want to ask you, Ms. Moore, to what extent do you think, uh, you know, the psychological element or even, you know, the, the, which is one of the elements for creating customer international law, is helpful in creating or framing the customer international law at uh, a micro level, which you call the deliberation of judges. Because as we were discussing that they could have different um, views or the holders may have different views or, or theories. And uh, their, then their subjectivities will find uh, a phenomena in a way by this deliberation process uh, to strengthen their perception, which might be sometimes moderated by various interests. So in that context, judges tend to create objective customary international law, which rather is based on sometimes on their subjectivities, you see. Um, so to what extent do you think that in a world where we live today, it is helpful for, for you know, international legal order or even uh, could be a cause of discouraging the Eastern states such as China, let's say, uh, to, to recognize uh, the ICJ jurisdiction um, and to what extent do you think that, uh, you know, even if they accept, that might be a cause of why they're reserving um, uh, the jurisdiction of ICJ in certain matters? Thank you. And do you want to take the next, next question? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Julia, please. Julia. Sure. So I had two points that were building on Julian Chase's suggestion that maybe collegiality and sort of the the collective or cooperative nature of the decision-making process were distinct concepts. And so as to the first point, I might've missed this in the presentation, if, which, uh, in which case I'm really sorry. But um, when you're talking about the minimalist reasoning that the court sometimes, the ICJ sometimes uses, um, you suggested that the court wants to avoid having uh, I guess, multiple opinions or dissents or concurrent opinions. And so I was wondering if that's uh, part of the, uh, if that's part of the formal rules of the courts or, it, or of the ICJ, or if that is actually not really part of the formal organization of the decision-making process, but a norm to which most of the, the judges um, commit. So just, I guess, to enhance the, the legitimacy of the court's decision. So in the, if, if it's more of a norm that the judges don't want to have dissenting opinions or really want to speak with one voice, then I don't know if that's quite the same thing as the like cooperative or the collective nature of the, the formal decision-making process. And then second, then I could then also see a distinction, depending on what you mean by collegiality, um, almost an inverse relationship between collegiality and the formal organization of the decision-making process. So if collegiality refers to sort of the more the informal social relations amongst judges. Um, I'm, I don't think that's completely distinct. I mean, I think it's probably influenced by the decision-making process. But then in some cases, then you might actually see an inverse relationship between the collegiality of the judges and what you pointed out, the, the um, tendency of using minimalist reasoning in the decisions or taking argumentative shortcuts because they'd have trouble getting consensus. So because there's something be, there's, it, you could say that the more collegial, uh, so the more the stronger these informal social ties are amongst the judges, then the more consensus you would have in a decision and then the less minimalist the reasoning would need to be. Those were just my two points. Thank you. Okay, I will take Julia's points first, which I think are uh, uh, kind of like easier to deal with than the one that Fozia made, because Fozia made a very uh, um, a, a wide ranging comment, which there will be such, you know there will be many things to say about it. So I'm going to take Julia's first. Um, so in relation to your first comment, no, there isn't any formal 
anything, any formal decision, any formal guideline that says that the judges have to speak with one voice as much as possible. It just, it's just a cult, an SEJ culture thing, really. Judges don't like when, uh, I suppose there's a reason why in, in nearly 100 years since the beginning of the Permanent Court of International Justice, we only had four decisions that were made by the casting vote of the president, because there is a conscious effort to try and find a, a text that, that has as many judges behind it as possible. And sometimes, at least in my, in my, times of the ACJ, in my time at the ACJ, I've seen uh, judges have making a decision, for example, 11 to 5 or 10 to 6, which might seem like a strong majority, but there was some discontent within the court because, you know, it's an 11 to 5 decision. It's not really, you know, we could have done more really to, to, uh, to, to uh, around it. So the, the thing is, that isn't necessarily reflecting in the separate opinions that are appended afterwards, because uh, the reality is that some, some judges, you, are, you will be certain 100% that whatever you say in the judgment, they will have a separate opinion, but simply because maybe it's a cultural thing from where they come from, or maybe they're just, they have just really big egos and they want to say what they think. I mean, they're all human beings at the end of the day. And one thing that unfortunately the, scholar, the scholarship on custom hasn't been doing so far, and what I suppose I'm trying to guess at by studying in this direction is understanding that really when we're dealing with custom, we're also dealing with people that are simply human beings and they have their own strengths, their own weaknesses, their own, their own limitations, and they work within the framework of established procedures, which is what exactly the deliberation process would be. In relation to the collegiality point that you're making, um, I, I kind of like see this more as a com of a comment than as a question. I would agree with you in a way, if they had stronger informal ties, perhaps, and more, you know, have collegiality in that sense, they might have less of a problem with uh, coming up to, with coming up with minimalistic reasoning in a way. Um, the reality is that International Court of Justice judges, and I'm speaking for the SCJ only because that's the one I know, they see each other, but in the corridors of the court, you know, it's not like they're not best friends necessarily. So uh, some of them might actually live for, it for extended periods of time uh, away from the seat of the court. So they actually come to the court for the judicial business and then they're off back to the country of origin or to the university where they work and so on. So suppose that it is true. Um, it's something that there's a, there's a scholar, there's a scholar in, in Cambridge called John Bell that um, wrote about the, um, the uh, source of law in the early common law uh, development in England. And one of the points he was making in one of his uh, articles was that the, uh, the way the common law developed is also due to the fact that there were a number of people that were uh, part of the same circle, educated in the same way, and shared a number of common values, basically. And that's how also the common law developed. I suppose that if judges were doing the same in, in, in the ICJ, then maybe we would have a very different sort of doing, uh, a, di a different manner of doing things than we do. Now, it is also true that if you say that you want them to be educated in the same place and be part of the same circle, and you take away a lot of what international law is. So I'm not suggesting that we should go in that direction, but I'm just saying there's, a, there's probably a parallel there um, and something that we can think about. Um, I would like then to pass to Fawz's question about the psychological element and the way that um, subjective views of judges can influence the way that uh, customer international law is identified and uh, how that might impact the way in which Eastern states such as China um, um, accede to the ICJ's jurisdiction. I mean, I suppose that the first thing that I would like to say is that the fact of having 15 judges that work, all, the, all of which, all of whom, sorry, work on the same text should be a way of avoiding the subjective views of one judge or of two judges being too strongly represented in the judgment. That doesn't mean that, of course, uh, the individual views of certain judges would not be represented in the judgment, but at least to me, the fact of having uh, 15 judges, sometimes even 17 if you count the ad hoc judges, um, should be something that counterbalances giving too much weight to, for example, the judges, uh, the views of the judges on the drafting committee, rather than the views of the judge that speaks with a, you know, with a bigger voice in the, in the deliberation room. But I suppose that one, one other thing that your question for made me thought, think about was, um, and that's about the, the, the question about the China and the court jurisdiction, is actually, um, it's, it's more about diversity really in, in, in international law and, and on the international bench. Because I suppose that one, one of the, um, one of the problems that states uh, from, uh, from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America have been reproaching to international law for a very long time is that international law as we know it today is, uh, has its roots in, in the colonial endeavor of, of European states back in the 19th century. And a lot of the categories and a lot of the ways that we think about international law are still very much rooted in that. 
Um, so, for example, you know, since we're in Hong Kong, the whole idea of the uh, of the uh, treaties for the session of Hong Kong Island and Kowloon having been imposed on the Qing Empire at the time uh, by by the British Empire. I suppose that you know, if as if the international bench were made differently, if there were different conventions, different ways of, of electing judges, we might actually have. Uh, some broader participation by countries in different parts of the world to the uh, courts, to the courts proceedings and the courts jurisdiction. China, for that matter, I think, only participated in, twice in proceedings in the International Court of Justice, never in contentious proceedings and always in advisory cases in, and always in cases that had to do with self-determination of statehood. I suppose because of the, of the, of the issue uh, with, uh, with Taiwan, of course. Um, so there are cases in which countries do show up, uh, but the problem there is uh, that they show up when it is, of course, uh, instrumental to their own, to their own needs and to their own agenda. Um, I suppose that um, I, I need to think a bit more about how that links, feeds into the, the determination of customer international law. I'm sure that there are ways in which it does, but I think it's something a bit complex that I have to think a bit some more instead of giving an answer right now. I, maybe we can, you know, <laughs> discuss it between the two of us at some point. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, um, uh, Massimo, and thank you, uh, Professor Chase, and thank you all of you for joining us. Um, I'm aware of the time we are overrunning, and um, again, I apologize for the um, delay. Um, so thank you, everyone. I think um, I think we had a very fruitful discussion, and um, I hope you guys will, will will join us next time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.